All right, welcome to the 16th in our series on Middle Eastern Islamic history. We've covered all of uh, the history of Islam in the Middle East from the time of uh, Muhammad and even a little bit before him onwards. And we're now in the 15th century, sorry, we're in the 14th century uh, with Tamerlan and the Timurids, the Timurids being the successors to Tamerlane. Now, um, just to go over uh, the rules for those of you who are unfamiliar, um, this is not an academic presentation. I am not an academic. Uh, I'm not certified in history, uh, culture, language, any of the things that we're going to be talking about today. I'm just a lay person who really enjoys this. And I'm going to try and give a secular presentation, right? I'm going to try and give a presentation without a religious lens or scoping. Um, I'm going to ask that everybody be respectful. Of course, this is going to be a difficult topic. Um, so it's important to maintain that. But at the same time, interactivity is highly prized. I love questions, comments, clarifications, and we can talk about these things in more detail. Um, as is typical of all the previous uh, entries into the series, this will be what I call a 101 and 201, meaning that if you don't know anything, I'll catch you up. And if you know a lot, well, I'll probably tell you something you still don't know. And finally, um, like all of the previous uh, sessions, this session will be recorded. And so you can watch it later and compare it with previous sessions and sort of follow the through line. All right, so everybody remembers the quiz, the favorite part of the presentation to see what you remembered from last time. And so question number one, why were the peoples of greater Iran initially very supportive of the Ilkhanit Hulugu Khan? <laughs> Any ideas, Catherine? I would say B and C. Um, it's it's just B. Um, it's B. Uh, yeah, this is one of the ones with only one answer. But yeah, exactly. Hulegu gave hope to the people of Greater Iran that they would be united under one powerful authority instead of being subject to numerous wars. Um, the reason A is wrong is that Persians really didn't care about Chinese knowledge. It just wasn't something that they were looking for. Um, uh, C is wrong because uh, the Seljuks were not uh, Sunni extremists. There was intent to repress, especially the Ismaili states uh, in northern Iran. Um, but there were occasions, especially during the civil wars between Bakhyaruk and Muhammad I Tapar, that the Ismailis were actually brought in as part of Bakhyaruk's coalition, right? So um, they were religious as Sunnis, but they weren't fundamentalist about it. And then D is false. Um, that's probably closer to the perspective taken by other Arabs uh, to Hulegu Khan and, um, I, sorry, by Arabs to Hulegu Khan or by the Golden Horde, uh, because the leader of the Golden Horde, Berke Khan, had converted to Islam. And this was one of the grievances he leveled at Hulegu Khan, which started their war in 1262. All right, question number two. After Rabban Ban Salma, uh, sorry, after Rabban Bar Salma was prevented from making a pilgrimage to Jerusalem by Ilkhan Argun, Argun sends him onwards to Europe with which main purpose? I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You want to answer? To, to start, didn't he want to start crusades? Yeah, that's exactly right. It's answer C, right? Argun yeah. intended to make an alliance between the European leaders, especially the Franks and the Ilkhans, so they could defeat their mutual enemy of Mamluks. The way they would do that is with, through a crusade, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that was the, the thought process. Um, Argun wasn't interested in European crossbows and siege technologies, the ones coming out of China, specifically the Chokonu, right? That's a type of crossbow, and Chinese uh, mangonels. Um, and as along with Dam Damascene uh, trebuchets were more than effective as uh, siege technologies. Um, Argon um, did not uh, ask for tribute from the European states. He may well could have, uh, but I think he figured that the distance was too big and the need for a military alliance too great than to ask for tribute. And um, Argon uh, had no ability to control the Mediterranean. Um, the Ilkhan had no effective military fleet, uh, naval fleet. Um, their main forces operated on land. Okay, question number three. <clears throat> Which three of the following are actions proposals taken by Ilkhan Ghazi? Uh, 
All right, uh, Rich. Yeah. I think you would get lost here for a second. That's all right. You're back. Okay. Um, yeah. So which three of the following are actions proposals taken by Ilhan Ghazan? Um, and can you see the slide? Yes, cool. Loud okay. and clear. Yeah, very good. Okay. Yeah, you can see it now. Any guesses? Mm -hmm. Probably C is one of them. Okay, C is one of them. I don't know. F sounds suspect, but uh, I'll go with F. <laughs> I don't know. F. F. Yeah, I was say F, F F is definitely false. Um, so uh, yeah, the answers are A, D is C, and D. D looks interesting. What? Uh, D looks interesting, or is that too yeah. late? Yeah, no, no. D D is D is also a correct answer, right? It's A, yeah. C, and D. Um, yeah. Ghazan went through an intolerant period for a few years, um, and but afterwards he realized that intolerance was not the effective way to run uh, an empire. Um, and he eventually uh, switched courses. He became a patron of several Georgian and Armenian churches. He reached out to the Nestorian hierarchy in, in Baghdad. Um, and um, one of the most important things, and that's sort of brought about, uh, sort of goes into the reason why D is also correct, is that despite converting to Islam, he didn't ally with Muslim majority states, right? He continued the Mongols' uh, desire to expand territory and continued uh, wars against the Mamluks. Um, the Mamluks, because of their effective border on the on the Euphrates River, were able to repel uh, Ghazan's invasions, and um, by 1303 had reestablished the border at the Euphrates. Um, uh, Rashid al-Din Hamadani um, was responsible for the Iqtar land parceling, that's why C is correct. Um, B is false when he converted to Islam as part of the repression. It wasn't just against Christians and Jews, it was also against the Buddhists. And the Buddhist Bakshi, uh, who had been brought in by the by Hulegu Khan and other Ilkhans, uh, were forced to go back to Tibet. Um, Buddhism was effectively um, no longer permitted within the borders of the Ilkhanate after Ghazan came to power. Um, uh, answer E is correct, but for the wrong Khan um, that belonged to Uljaitu, his successor. Uh, he fought a Shagatai invasion and then was defeated by the Kartids. And then F is false when Marco Polo and Kokichin arrived in 1293 um, in, uh, in, in Persia. Uh, they were actually invited in and Kokichin became one of Ghazan's uh, wives. For those of you who've seen the Marco Polo series, that's the blue boyot woman that, you know, in, in the series, Marco has a romantic relationship with her. In reality, it doesn't seem that there was anything uh, remotely fiery between them. All right, question number four. Uh, which of the following accurately explains why the Ilkhanate collapsed? D. I have somebody. I think D, right? Yeah, somebody in the comments uh, actually beat you to it, Greg. Uh, it's Haruki. Ah. Um, and uh, D is correct. Uh, Abu Sayyid Bahadur had no mm -hmm. heirs or legitimate successors. And it's one of the strange uh, instances in history where the empire actually collapsed without a prior fall or decline. Um, from all historical accounts that we have, and we don't have that many from Abu Sayyid Bahadur's reign, um, it seems like the, econo the economy was doing relatively well. Um, there was no uh, massive uh, threat from enemies outside of the territory. There were numerous wars, but nothing of the Ilkhanate couldn't uh, hold back. And um, the trade was still continuing. Uh, it just happened that they had no successors left for a Kuril tie. And so I think uh, Richard is just trying to make it uh, so that we appreciate <laughs> everything he says. You disappeared again, my friend. Oh, sorry. Um, you yeah, ended apparently. with cruelty. 
Yeah. So thanks. So there was no person left in a cruel tie um, to replace Abu Said Bahadur. So effectively, it just collapsed into all the iqta, all those divisions that had been set um, by Rashid al-Din Hamadani during Ghazan's administration. And so you had this collapse into a number of small state, uh, states and entities. Um, the, while those entities were, uh, A is false because the Golden Horde and Mamluks were aligned and the Shakhtai and the Neguderi were aligned, but those four were never aligned together and they never all attacked at the same time. Um, Rashina, uh, uh, B is false because there was never a revolt by the Ikta, um, Turks and Mongols against the government. It just ended up being in their hands. Um, <laughs> and C is false because the Black Death would hit um, Iran in the period after the fall of the Ilkhanate. Uh, it hit during this period of numerous statelets um, in the 1340s, especially 1347 until the mid 1350s. And the Ilkhanate fell in 1335. All right. So um, if we remember, right, in 1262, 1262 was when the Mongol Empire really divided between the five uh, and would eventually become four uh, major entities, right? The goal. by enemies. The Mamluks were enemies, the Golden Horde were enemies, the Chakatai were enemies. The only allies they had were the UN dynasty with whom they didn't share a border, right? Um, and- uh, Richard, can I uh, ask you something? If sure. I remember correctly, uh, I remember that the Golden Horde of, of, uh, kind of divided between the White Horde and Blue Horde. And if I remember correctly, the White Horde was the Western part and the Blue was the Eastern part. But here it kind of like shows that the White Horde is the Eastern one. Uh, uh, how did you get these maps? Uh, I'm just curious. Um, do you recall anything like that? I, I think he's frozen. He's frozen now. Your, you didn't like your question. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> no, no, no. no, no did, um, did, did you hear what, what no, I said? I, I heard your question. I don't know what's what's wrong on my end, but okay. Um, this is from a website called Geocron, and sometimes their maps are somewhat inaccurate, but the thing is I can get a map from any year, which is really helpful because a lot of these places, they don't have accurate maps from the time period. Um, and you're right that the Blue Horde was further east than the White Horde. The White Horde should be closer to uh, the Ural River, which you can see is uh, in the territory of the Golden Horde. Um, but yeah, the, the Volga River was dividing them, actually. Exactly. So it should be the White Horde. It should be Blue Horde where it says white. Yeah, I think. That, yes. No, that's absolutely right. Um, yeah. So, but uh, yeah. Somebody um, was colorblind when they created the the the, the map. I know, right? You, they, they made the white horde green, and they made All the right. golden horde green. Like who, you know, who's 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 behind this? But if we remember in 1335, right, that's the last year of Abu Said Bahadur's reign, and you notice that with respect to the Mongol states, the border hasn't changed pretty much at all, right? The Chakatai, the, the Golden Horde, and the Ilkhanate have roughly the same boundaries because neither was able to win a successful victories against the other one, right? So then, then you have this collapse of the Ilkhanate. And we remember several of the things that we talked about during our opening, right? That uh, Ojaitu had moved the capital of the Ilkhanate to Sultania, which had become a blossoming city, even during the time of the Black Death. Uh, sweeping uh, the former Ilkhanate, that the leaders had almost all converted to Islam, that um, they had signed uh, treaties with the Mamluks to try and create peace. And so the Mamluks didn't attack most of these divided states or generally left them alone, that the system of Aqsa had been set up by Rashid al-Din Hamadani, and that there was sort of a, an interest in the West, but that of course died away when the Ilkhanate lacked power. And so these regimes were much more focused in and on, on themselves. So when you have this collapse of the Ilkhanate, right, you end up with all of these different Ikta states. Um, and I have a question here. Um, 
somebody is mentioning that I heard that Russian absolutism came from nobles back in the time of the Golden Horde, uh, exploiting the peasants to pay tribute to the Golden Horde. Um, and this is why the Russian Empire and Russian absolutism was so, so horrible for the people. And the Novgorod Republic wasn't in the Golden Horde's influence and therefore uh, became a thriving republic. Is this true? Um, as far as I know, the Republic, of, the Republic of Novgorod didn't exist by this time. I think it was, I think it was gone by this time. But the Russians can correct me here. Um, my intuition is that Russian absolutism was horrible um, as a reaction to having to fight the Mongols, right? The things like Alexander Nevsky and and the unification of the Russian principalities in order to create some kind of entity that could fight back uh, required an absolutist state. But um, I would leave it to the Russians in the group to uh, provide more clarity on that. Well, uh, I, I could add that uh, uh, Novgorod was, was not conquered, but they submitted to the uh, uh, order a horde um, uh, uh, because they knew that they had no chance so they were part of uh, so the way they they ruled they usually gave what they call uh, yarlik uh, uh, on a rule or ruling uh, and uh, yes there was a novgorod principality uh, 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 already ex uh, ex existed uh, i mean they used to call uh, princess uh, to govern them but uh, they hold uh, what they call vetcha which was kind of like a uh, ecclesia in in ancient Greece. You know, they they all the population was of the city of Novgorod uh, gathering and making decisions. But of course, they were influenced, and uh, so that's how it was organized. Yeah, a lot of people think that yes, the Russian absolutism was influenced uh, by the the rule. I mean, psychologically, probably not uh, because that's what they came from. Um, uh, that's what how they learn how to rule the new generation by the time uh, you know, Ivan the uh, Third in the uh, 1480. That's considered to be the beginning uh, of the real independence of Moscovites, uh, uh, Moscovy uh, from Golden Horde. Uh, so it was influenced uh, 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 the Russian absolutism, I, I believe. Yeah. So it's interesting fact as a child. Uh, we had a program where we, they used to have, uh, you know, movies, you know, children movies, and most of the bad characters like Baba Yaga is created from the, uh, you know, depiction of the Golden Horde, uh, you know, so to speak, uh, you know, emirs and stuff like that. Uh, so Baba Yaga was a depiction, let's just say, would be some Han or something like that. And then all these bad characters and for the Russian tales. So that was an interesting fact. Yeah, I think I think that's absolutely correct. Uh, thanks, uh, Greg, for the contribution, um, and thank you, Zach, as well. Um, a lot of a lot of the I think the growth of Russian absolutism and the expansion to the east was out of the psychological trauma of not knowing what uh, what invaders would come from the east. And Timur, what we're going to talk about today, we're not going to talk much about the Russian front, but absolutely, Timur. Um, left an indelible impression on the Russian psyche as well, um, given that he almost took Moscow um, and uh, sacked many of the major uh, Rus principalities. Yeah, but also Tokhtamish took, uh, uh, burned Moscow. Yeah. Uh, 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 first time, but then second time he saved Moscow in a way uh, because he interfered with uh, Timur. Uh, right. that's, that's the only reason he didn't uh, uh, go there. But uh, yeah, but there was a chaos in, uh, in Moscow at the time. Uh, so once you have this collapse, the Ilkhanid, as a political entity, the Ilkhanid stops being, when these states that compose the Ilkhanid stop being really strong entities in and of themselves, right? They start basically controlling their own territory, but not really being expansionist, which brings us to Tamerlane, right? So we're shifting now from, you know, 13th, the 1340s, 1350s, um, and we're moving into the 1360s, right? So Timur um, was born probably around 1329 or so. He made it official that he was born in 1336. We're going to sort of explain a little bit later why he changed his birth year. But Timur, before we talk about the conquests he did and the, and the wars he waged, I want to sort of go through who he was as a person. So one of the interesting things is that he caught is that he definitely copied some of what Genghis Khan did in declaring himself, quote, the scourge of God, right? That he, that his 
purpose was as divine retribution uh, for those who failed to acknowledge uh, his supremacy and his and his power. Um, but at the same time, um, he was at least nominally a, a devoted Muslim in terms of how he perceived himself. Now, most Muslims today, considering the fact that almost all of his victims or over over sixty percent of his victims were were Muslims, uh, kind of find it hard to square uh, with him being a, supposedly a pious Muslim. But we know that he went to mosque and he prayed, and he was also connected to the Naqshbandi order, um, as we discussed a little bit last time. There are a number of Sufi orders that are coming into existence at roughly this time, and these Sufi orders um, are a mystical tradition within Islam. But a lot of people misunderstand the Sufi traditions as being a more passive or more um, peaceful version of Islam. That's not the case. The, they can be peaceful, they can be violent, uh, but the element that makes a tradition a Sufistic tradition um, has to come a lot from the nature of the practice, that it's a mystical practice, that it's a very... Yes, it's a bad uh, internet connection. Rich, interesting fact while Richard pulling it up, um the a lot of the russian um you know they call them knyaz like nevsky was one of the dukes in in, in the united states you call them dukes prince in russian prince, prince, prince. prince. Yeah. yeah so a lot of the russian um dukes for example nevsky when they fought when he fought the teutonic order he actually had mongols help him um during that fight and that does interesting fact so you know so, it's interesting and it's in Russian culture, it's kind of hush hush, right? During the Soviet time, we didn't know that was the fact and it wasn't told to us that <clears throat> Nevsky seeked help from Mongols to fight Teutonic Knights um, uh, in the West. Were they mercenaries or was it an ally? He was allied with Mongols uh, mm. against Teutonic yeah, but, but Basically they were allied until they weren't, right? That, that's basically yeah. what it was. Yeah. You were mentioning uh, Timberland being the scourge of God. I've got a biography of Attila the Hun here, <clears throat> and they were commenting, uh, they, they were describing what was meant by the scourge of God. They were translating it as the whip of God. In a sense, Attila the Hun was not a wee evil person, was mean to Christians. Um, the Christians were bad, and Attila the Hun was a vengeance sent by God to teach them a lesson. I think if you're rampaging across the countryside and massacring people and stuff like that, it's nice to have somebody come forward and, and say you're actually doing something good. I'm not I'm not familiar with that, but could be. As I was mentioning with Nakhshbandiya, um, so you have this Sufi doctrine that's developing in Uzbekistan at roughly the same time that Timur was living uh, by this name Bahadin Nakhshband. And so the way that Nakhshband wanted to elevate the spiritual experience was through very strong focus on the moment, right? So you can see the 11 steps of Nakhshbandiya, which are almost all about, uh, you know, uh, being focused on the breath, watching your step, being aware of the time. Um, and this created a very sort of regimented mentality, which makes Nakhshbandiya uh, particularly susceptible to being used in military campaigns, right? Because it's the same sort of regimentation that you require in the military. So the, uh, there has been a long history of Naqshbandiya being affiliated with extremist or militant Islamic uh, groups and orders um, and governments. Now there's also a long history of Naqshbandiya who are peaceful and the majority of Naqshbandiya alive are, are still peaceful. Um, but uh, during the time of Timur, his being a Naqshbandi and a pious Naqshbandi doesn't in any way mean that he was not interested uh, in the kinds of conquest and blood bloodbaths that he created. There was really no friction there. Um, one of the, and Timur was also known as a very intellectual person. Um, he loved strategy. And in fact, in contrast to Shingis Khan and Minke Khan and many of the great Mongols, great, I mean, in terms of power, uh, great Mongols that we looked at, um, Tamerlane wanted to be at every single battle. He like So if there was a campaign going on in a place where he wasn't, he would go there and desert whatever campaign he was on. Um, he didn't really trust others 
to be leading without his direct example. And part of his love for strategy involved his playing the game of chess. And he played chess so often and in so many different ways that he developed his own game of chess. And you can see one of Tamerlan's uh, opening positions in uh, his own chess. And you can see that, that it's not just the same uh, positions they are used to. There are giraffes and camels and elephants, and these pieces move differently uh, than any of the other pieces on the board, right? They have their own uh, sort of behaviors, and it goes to his sense of strategy and how um, he would want things played out. Finally, in the upper right-hand side, you can see a dilapidated building. This is the tomb of Sarai Khanum, and it's important to address who she is um, when it comes to the concept of good again. So if, if I can mention here, uh, good again was this title of honorary son-in-law. One of the problems that Timur had in terms of legitimizing his power uh, as he was beginning to increase in power is that according to the Mongolic world, in order to be a legitimate holder of power, you needed to be a descendant of Shingis Khan. And as far as uh, Timur could tell, he wasn't. Um, he was um, a, a, from a Mongolic family, a, a Turkic Mongolic family, but he didn't have that kind of lineage. And so he married uh, Sarai Mulkhanem uh, in order to guarantee that he would be um, a person in that line, right? He would theoretically be married to a Chinggisan. And that's why he got this name good again, which means honorary son-in-law. Right, because he's now theoretically the son-in-law of Shingis Khan. He's, he's built into that lineage. Now, um, so of course, when she died, he made this beautiful tomb for her. Uh, this is what remains of it, or remained of it when the picture was taken. So we also need to talk about Samarkand, which when Timur finally consolidated his power, became the center of his world. Um, it was a place that he would retreat to between campaigns, and he used a lot of the wealth that he plundered during his campaigns, especially from India, um, to build Samarkand. So you can see on the left-hand side, you have the Gure Amir, which is his um, funeral mausoleum. And on the left-hand side, you can see sort of what it looks like from the outside. And uh, in the top left center, I guess you could say, um, you can see what it looks like from the inside. That's from the inside of the cupola, um, an incredibly exquisite uh, a set of carvings and lighting. It's, it's a really incredible structure, of course, built by Persian and Central Asian artisans. In the upper right-hand side, you see Hafez. One of the things that really distinguishes uh, Timur in, in a lot of senses is that he considered himself an intellectual as well. And he corresponded with uh, the Persian poets who were effectively the intellectuals of the day. Um, Hafiz was one of these poets, and they have regular letters between them. Uh, Timur himself was also a poet, and he wrote a few uh, volumes of poetry. Finally, in the Persian spirit of creating large gardens, he created his own large gardens. And you can see an image of that from one of the miniatures, where Timur feasts in the gardens of Samarkand. So now that I've established him as this incredibly contemplative, erudite, religious, you know, person, now we're gonna see a very different side of him, um, which is not any of those things. So he started in the area of the Chagatai Khanate and the Chagatai, unlike the Ilkhanate, um, had divided into a number of sub Khanates that were at war with each other. Uh, Timur managed to become a general in one of these uh, pretenders uh, arsenals and he was able to defeat the other ones by 1379. But of course, right, as we said, under Mongolic code, he couldn't actually take power. Um, and the reason he couldn't take power, right, is because he was not a Chinggisid. At the same time, in the Islamic world, he couldn't take the title of Caliph because as we've discussed uh, previously when we talked about the tenets of Islam, um, only a person from the tribe of Quraysh has permission under Sunni, under Sunni jurisprudence to become Caliph. This will change eventually, but at this time it was still very powerful. Um, and of course, in the Shiites is even more narrow. It had to come from somebody directly descended from Muhammad, not just somebody from Muhammad's larger tribe, right? But either way, he couldn't be a caliph. And so he would take the title Amir or prince um, in the Islamic world. And 
in terms of his power in the Chakot Iconet, he chose a Chinggisid that he felt would be easily malleable, and that was uh, Suyor Ghatmish. Um, Suyor Ghatmish then became effectively the Khan of the Chakot Iconet, um, even though uh, he knew quite well that he wielded no actual power and that all power really resided with Timur. Now, at this time, once Timur had secured uh, the Chakot Iconet more or less within his power, um, you had a fight within the Golden Horde. And the Golden Horde had just defeated the Blue Horde, and the Blue Horde's leader, Tuktamish, was uh, a refugee, um, a political asylee um, to the Chakot Iconet and to Timur. So Timur saw this as a great opportunity to pacify relations with the Golden Horde. He launched an invasion of the Golden Horde with Tuktamish at its head and installed Tuktamish now as a puppet of the Golden Horde um, in order to create that sort of peaceful northern border and so that he could focus on maintaining the Chagatai Khanet and expanding the borders there. All right. So can I just add a small piece from his, you know, where he was born and just a little bit and sure. then uh, continue. So um, the um, Timur was born in um, uh, Shakrizaps, which is a current area in, in very close to Samarkand. And he was born to, you can think of it, um, to, you would think of it like a knight or middle level um, bureaucrat. His father was, if you would can translate today's days, it, it's like he was like a knight type of stuff. So what's interesting is um, uh, when he was growing up, you can think of him as being a mercenary, as Richard had pointed out. He had his friend of his who he ended up actually marrying his sister. His name is Hussein. And they created, they were kind of bandits going around the area and basically pillaging and, um, you know, uh, trying to get their name, you know, their name out there. And what's interesting about his character, this person Hussein, that he's, you know, married to his you know, uh, sister, he ended up betraying that guy. And um, I believe, you know, what, what had happened to Hussein, he beheads the guy. And uh, therefore, now he's a little bit out, you know, he already has an army behind him. And there is a, a particular, uh, uh, um, particular uh, period when Samarkand was trying to break free from Chinggisids or Chinggis Khan's, you know, descendants. And there's this people, they call themselves, uh, they call them Hank or Serbadars. And uh, what happened is they're able to assemble people to uh, defend the Samarkand and free Samarkand from these people, Chinggisids, and to be free from the uh, complete, um, from Mongols. And they're waiting for Timur to help them. So Timur was part of this Barlas uh, tribe, which is half Mongolic, half uh, Turkic. And uh, so he kind of belongs to the both. So instead of Timur helping this Sarbadars, which they're saying will help, he leaves them alone. And what's happening, Sarbadars ended up defeating the um, defeating the uh, uh, Chinggisids and free themselves. And then he comes back later because he was pretty crafty, as had Richard had noted. He comes back later uh, and, you know, basically whistles his way through and he says, Listen, we can't really go against Chinggisids. You have to give it back, give back Samarkand to Chinggisids. And that's when they buy into it. And instead, he took over Samarkand for himself. I just wanted to point that out. That also, on top of it, even though he was a very pious, um, religious person, he did drink and he didn't let other people drink. But uh, there was an interesting fact when he died, he was buried in the feet of uh, a pious man, a cleric because he said that when, you know, when God would see me, uh, at least I can clear my scenes by being buried in the feet of the, of this, um, of the cleric because of the fact that I have seen all my life throughout. And he also told all of his warrior soldiers to destroy any evidence of alcohol that, you know, he, they might've been. And he, would, he used to go into alcoholic stupor, even though he not allow, was not allowed to drink. Uh, as a you know pious Muslim, and what's interesting, his grandson uh, Uluq Bek was buried by himself in uh, Gora Amir, which is their um, burial uh, mount. Go ahead, Rich. Sorry. 
Yeah. No, uh, uh, that's all uh, really special. Um, one of the things is that, so now we've established that he's a mirror of the Shachatai Khanet, um, and so he expands his uh, attentions to the city of Urgenj. Now we've spoken about Urgenj before, that was a place where um, Shingis Khan uh, was responsible for one of the worst massacres in world history, uh, in terms of just on one city. Um, Timur's invasion is actually not that bad at first. He takes the city. He would eventually return um, during, the, during the fight that he had with Toksamish um, and brutally attack the city. Um, the, the main uh, issue is that there were a number of tribal groups that were running it uh, called the Safids. Um, and the Safids, um, led by Yusuf Safi, um, refused to initially acknowledge Timur's power. And after Timur had taken the city, um, about 10 years later, they launched a rebellion. And we're gonna see this as a repetitive trend that launching a rebellion uh, in a city that Timur believes he controls is usually not a good outcome uh, for the people of that city. So you ne then have the first Persian campaign and in the first Persian campaign is when we start to see a massive change in the way that Timur is fighting wars. Like we talked about with Urgench, right? He was relatively lenient with the people that he uh, conquered in 1379. And even before then, when he was uniting the Shakhatai domains, he was relatively lenient with the people he conquered. Um, but when he started getting to Persia, he started um, piling up bodies and skulls. Um, and we see this, um, sharp change and there are historical questions about why it was implemented. Um, some people believe that he was trying to emulate Shingis Khan and prove that he was indeed worthy of Mongol power. Some say that he wanted to do it for the same reason the Mongols did, which was to limit uh, the possibility of reprisals uh, in the cities that he attacked. Um, and we have particularly gruesome stories of some of the things he did, especially in what's now modern Afghanistan. Um, one is the small town of Isfizad, um, which had a defending garrison of about 2000 uh, people. And what Timur did is that he blew up the wall uh, by sending miners under the wall to release explosives and, and cause a cave-in uh, of the wall. And once the wall had caved in, uh, Timur killed, sorry, Timur captured all of the rebels and then, met, and then built them into a new wall um, while they were still alive, right? So you have these sort of stories of the kinds of brutality that he would inflict just to prove that you should not, um, <laughs> you should not rebel. Now the first Persian campaign uh, ended up securing uh, significant amounts of territory um, around uh, Iran and brought in a number of, especially on the Eastern side, uh, of those smaller states, like the Karmanids and the uh, and the regions of Khorasan and Juarez. Now, once he had consolidated his power, especially in eastern Iran and to a lesser degree uh, the western area, um, we then see um, the relationship with Toktomish breaking down. Now, in 1382, as Greg pointed out, uh, Toktomish and um, and Timur were working together to bring the Mosk um, uh, Moscow and the other Russian principalities under the power of uh, the Golden Horde um, that Toktomish now took the power of. But uh, after that victory, there began to become increasingly frosty relations between Toktomish and uh, Timur, as Toktomish tried to break uh, his uh, subservience to uh, subservience to Timur. Now he launched an invasion in 1385 in Georgia. Um, and when uh, Timur uh, pushed that back, uh, he led an invasion of Central Asia in 1387. Uh, and Richard, so uh, could I uh, add a little bit uh, to this situation that led to the bur uh, burning of Moscow 1392 and the struggle between uh, uh, Toktomish and uh, Mamai? Uh, I don't know. Uh, that's that's uh, uh, in 1380 is considered to be one of the most important dates uh, in, in Russian history. 
uh, when the standing of uh, Moscow Prince uh, Dmitry Donskoy uh, 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 against the Mamai. Uh, and uh, uh, Mamai was, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this term called uh, Beklerbek. Uh, uh, no. Richard, no. Well, that's a military leader. I mean, he is also was not oh, a Chinggis. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Baylor Bay. Yeah. Oh, okay. My, I may. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, he also was not a Chinggisid, but he had uh, Bulak, who was Chinggisid, uh, and he used him. Uh, he was ruling through him a uh, white uh, uh, horde, uh, while Tokhtamesh assumed the rule of the blue horde, which was to the east. And he actually uh, took the tribute from uh, Moscow. Uh, I'm talking about Mamai. Uh, and then uh, when uh, Dmitry 1380 refused, uh, they had a major battle. It's called uh, a battle uh, Kulikovo uh, uh, field. Uh, and that battle uh, ended up in, in the defeat of Mamai. Uh, it was like the first time uh, the uh, Russian principality defeated uh, in a major battle, defeated uh, uh, Mongols or Tatars. And uh, what happened after that, Mamai lost, uh, 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 lost his power, but he went back into Crimea, that's his kind of homeland. Uh, he is still ruling White Horde. And at this point, there is a, uh, a, a war between Tokhtamish and Mamai. Uh, and uh, the battle really didn't happen because Tokhtamish is Chinggisid, the Mamai is not. During that battle at Kulikova, uh, Bulak, who was Chinggisid, died in a battle and Mamai lost his claim because he no longer has a Chinggisid through whom he could rule. So at the battle between them, uh, it really didn't happen because uh, Tokhtamish appealed to the Mamai's army and most of it immediately went on his side because he was a Chinggisid and uh, Mamai ran with the rest of his uh, 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 people. So after that, he was uh, uh, killed uh, by the order of Tokhtamish and Tokhtamish then in 1382 burned the Moscow. And this time uh, after Mamai was out of the uh, picture, he united uh, again, white and blue hordes. So now it, he became a very powerful leader of a golden horde. And that actually brought him into the conflict with Timur uh, because now he was uh, basically, he had an immense power uh, and uh, he was by, uh, I would say, uh, by the size of uh, army he could uh, field, uh, he was at least an equal uh, of Timur. And that's why at this point he became so ambitious. Uh, he was groomed by Timur to become this, but now he became, a, and, and it brought them into uh, conflict uh, because uh, uh, now he, is a, he united the uh, blue and white hordes. Okay, so uh, that's it. Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. Um, that once Tukhtomish then got that power and was able to field those large armies, that he considered that he could actually take on um, be uh, take on um, Timur. What was adding? Uh, what was one of his major causes bellies was that Timur, by expanding into Iran, was taking over historic territory of the Ilkhanate, right? And so he was now not in control just of what the future of one of the former great Khanates. Now he's into another one of the great Khanates and he's usurping his power um, by expanding into the Ilkhanid. And that was what Tokhtamish argued um, as his causes belly to attack uh, Timur and Timurid holdings. So um, in 1395, uh, Timur responded to Tokhtamish um, and uh, invaded Georgia three different times. While he couldn't conquer the Georgians, um, he did destroy significant parts of Georgia. And so um, it led irreversibly to the collapse of the Georgian state. Um, in terms of his wars with Russia, um, we've already spoken about how brutal they were. Um, and most of that sort of sits outside of the purview of the Middle East, but we're always gonna have to remember that because Timur leads his own campaigns period, uh, like every campaign he wants to lead himself, whenever he's dealing with Tokhtamish, it means that everybody else gets reprieve for those few years um, in the Middle East and in other regions that he controls. 
So one of the things that we mentioned, right, is that in, in that period is that uh, Timur wants to reinforce the area uh, that he shares uh, with Tokhtamish um, against those invasions, right? That, those invasions, as we pointed out, started in 1385. And so he sends military troops uh, through uh, the territory of the Muzaffarids and Jalairids um, who become his vassals, right? All the way up to that border region. And he arrives at the city of Isfahan, which is the Muzaffarid uh, capital. And they initially surrender to him and he occupies the city, puts his officials there and generally um, leaves the population intact. The problem occurs is that barely a month after he had left the city, while he was still very close to it, there was a revolt in the city and a number of his tax collectors were killed. Timur turned right around and invaded the city of Isfahan. Um, and he slaughtered between 100,000 and 200,000 people. Um, he then put those, uh, then he took those bodies and he um, built them into skull towers. You can sort of see what one of them would have looked like on the right-hand side. Um, the reports that we have from, uh, from the city report that there were 28 of these skull towers, each one with at least 1,500 heads. Um, and it was one of the most brutal massacres that, that area had seen, which is saying something as considering how much we went through all of uh, Shingis Khan's uh, massacres in the eastern part of Iran. After um, Isfahan, he direct uh, and having dealt with uh, Tokhtamish in 1395, he turned his attention to the subcontinent. And so he decided to invade uh, India, which was controlled by the Tughlaq dynasty. It was another um, uh, Turkic dynasty that was based in Delhi. And the uh, the battle that he waged was incredibly complex. He, in order to cross the Hindu Kush, he required a number of different aids to get him across the mountains. Remember, he was an old man at this point. He's in his 60s. But he still wanted to be at every campaign, in every location, making sure that the invasion proceeded according to his designs. So he finally gets to the battlefield and um, Nasir uh, ad-Din Muhammad Tughlaq uh, the leader of the, of, uh, the Sultanate, um, arrays a number of war elephants against Timur. And he coats their tusks in poison. Um, these are very formidable and scary animals, especially to the, Mago the majority of uh, the Mongolic troop, the Mongolic, Turkic, and Persian troops that uh, Timur had. Um, they didn't have experience with this. But Timur had heard that elephants frightened easily. So he took camels and he lit a fire on them uh, and he forced them to run into the elephant line screaming as they were burning alive. And this made the elephants very afraid. They turned around and marched to trample their own population. You can sort of see that uh, in the a miniature on the right-hand side, the elephants turning back on the uh, Indian, for want of a better term, uh, line and um, resulting in the defeat of uh, the Tughluq uh, Sultanate. Now, this resulted in one of the greatest sacks in terms of its monetary return um, that Timur had ever engaged in. He killed over 1 million uh, Indians when he took the city of Delhi and brought back massive caravans of gold uh, in order to rebuild his city of Samarkand. Um, Timur, unlike when we talked about Iran and Central Asia never wanted to add India to his domains. Um, and as soon as he got the wealth, he disappeared from the Indian subcontinent and relaxed in his gardens for about a year. So by the year 1400, we sort of have this situation where the Ottoman Empire controls most of the Anatolian Peninsula. We'll address why that is uh, in the next two lectures. But on the eastern side, you can see the Timurids control um, all the way up to um, what's now uh, southern Russia, including uh, Azerbaijan and modern Armenia. You have some Turkic tribes like the Akhkoyunlu and the Karakoyunlu um, 
in that area between the Timurids and the Ottoman Empire. Um, you have the Jalairids um, still controlling the Middle East, um, uh, especially uh, in Baghdad. But basically you have these two empires and a number of small Turkic tribes basically making up the difference. Um, as we said, George doesn't fall, but it becomes incredibly weakened in this same period. So this is sort of what the world is looking like in 1400. Now, Timur, after conquering uh, India, begins to turn his attention to the wider Middle East. Now, the first invasion of Baghdad take, uh, takes place in uh, 1393. Now you can see on this map that in 1384, he had taken much of Northern Iran, um, much of Southern Iran, um, and if we remember, um, he had uh, launched that siege at Isfahan in 1387. So the Muzaffarid area was already under his control as well. But between 1384 and 1393, um, the areas to the west of that remained under those independent rulers. In 1393, he invaded Baghdad for the first time against the Jalairids. And one of the important things to remember, right, as we said that Timur wanted to be in charge of all of his campaigns, he wanted to be present in all of his campaigns. Whenever he conquered a city, he put a governor in it and sort of left it alone to its own devices, which in Baghdad almost becomes a comedy of errors. So he leaves Baghdad in one of the, in the capable hands of one of his um, sarbadars, um, and one of his governors. Uh, and one year later, the Jalairids come back and without even fighting, um, they give the power back to the Jalairids. And so the Jalairids control the city from 1394 uh, until 1401. And in 1401, Timur comes back again and he invades Baghdad. And that is a much more serious invasion. We're gonna talk about that in a, in a bit. Um, but after 1401, he leaves his commander there and goes off uh, to Anatolia. And in that time, the Black Sheep Turks invade from the North in 1402 and they take the city of Baghdad. So Timur has to return again in 1403 to take the city back again. And in this comedy of errors, um, we, end up, uh, we end up seeing um, the relationship change between the Jalairids and the Black Sheep Turks. We're gonna talk about that a little bit in a second. But during that repeated intermission of going to Baghdad, coming out of Baghdad, um, Timur wanted to pursue the leaders who had ceded Baghdad in 1393 and followed them to the Mamluk Sultanate, which was in control of Syria at that point. Um, when Timur conquered the city of Aleppo, we have a number of stories about the horrific actions he took there. He went to the great mosque of Aleppo and he tied um, all the women and children against uh, the walls of the building while uh, the women were raped and the children were attacked. Uh, the men were often forced to watch as their wives and sisters were violated like this. Um, and um, after taking Aleppo, he did the same in Damascus. In fact, there is uh, a long history in Syria of using um, Timurian, for want of a better term, as a slur for the people of Damascus because of how much interracial mixing, of course, occurred because of these rapes, right? And so you have this sort of negative view of Timur that becomes inculcated in Syria for, I believe, good reason. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see the Mamluk Sultan Nasir al-Din Faraj uh, trying to fight off the Mongol influence. Um, he is unsuccessful in both Damascus, uh, sorry, in both Aleppo and Damascus, and uh, Timur was able to take those cities. Um, Fortunately for the Mamluks, uh, he wasn't able to hold them for very long because Timur died in 1405 and his subsequent heirs couldn't hold on to a significant portion of his territory. Now, as we mentioned, um, the Jalayarids and the Black Sheep Turks um, fought, against, uh, fought against Timur. And after 1403, um, the two of them fled to the Mamluk Sultanate, right? This same Mamluk Sultanate that um, had just lost in Damascus and Aleppo. And they imprisoned them uh, together because unlike uh, other, uh, they were, unlike other empires, they had fled to the Ottoman Empire before. Un uh, unlike these other empires, 
uh, the Mamluks were afraid of further uh, Timurid advances, and so they arrested these leaders with the thought that they would release that they would release them to uh, Timur in exchange for a peace treaty. When Timur died in 1405, um, they were released back from prison to their respective lands, and they continued their own conflict against each other, the Black Sheep Turks and the Jalayarids, um, despite in prison making an agreement to split the territory, roughly as you see it on the map here. So when we talked about Timur's invasions of Baghdad, his first invasion, as I mentioned, was in 1393. And in that invasion, he targeted the Assyrian Christian minority uh, to a particularly high degree. And one of the markers of that was the attack on the Green Church of Tikrit. Uh, Tikrit was a large Christian uh, city. The majority of the population of the city was Christian still, even after centuries of Islamic occupation. And these were Assyrian Christians, Nestorian church. Um, and um, he performed a massacre that was so massive that the Assyrian population in that city never recovered. Now, as I, as I mentioned, in 1393, Baghdad opened the doors to Timur, and so Timur did not massacre them. But when he came back in 1401 um, to find the Jalayarids in control of the city, he brooked no agreement. Um, and he broke the siege of the city. And once he took control of the city, he ordered his soldiers to kill um, a quota of people within the city. The problem, of course, was that there weren't enough people in the city to match the quotas. So you ended up having soldiers killing um, other soldiers and sometimes even their own wives, as you can sort of imagine from the picture on the right hand side, in order to fill the quota. Um, the city, uh, between the attack in 1258 under Hulgu and the subsequent siege by Timur in 1401, um, Baghdad did not recover its pre-1258 population until the 20th century. Now, after conquering Baghdad, um, Timur wanted to secure his alliances among those Eastern Turkey states. So fast, Sorry? No, no, it was just, I think, just somebody was just talking. Okay. Um, if we remember from uh, this slide, right, you have all of these Turkic groups um, between the Timurid Empire and the Ottoman Empire. And the Timurids had demanded um, va uh, vassalage and tribute from these small states, right? The Karakayunlu, the Black Sheep Turks, the Jalayarids, um, even after defeating them, um, the Akhoyunlu, the White Sheep Turks, the Turks in Erzinjan, the Dulkadir, um, all of these different groups. Uh, all these different groups. Can you still hear me? All right. Yes, we can hear um, you. All right. Yep. So um, all these different groups. And so they felt that these uh, Turkic nomads fell within their sphere of influence. Um, the Ottomans disagreed. And so you have the Ottomans reaching out to uh, the Mengujeks, the Mengujeks being one of these Turkic tribes. You can sort of see it on the map. And the Mengujeks um, ruled from Erzinjan. So that was the Erzinjan that you saw on the map, that blue state. Um, and, the, and that Beylik, Mutaherzen, um, was already paying tribute uh, to uh, sorry, was already paying tribute to uh, Timur, but the Ottomans requested tribute from them. And the moment that they did that, the Timurids uh, Timur said that this was a betrayal of the Ottomans, that they shouldn't demand tribute from their vassal, and they fought a war against them. And that war took place in that and that war took place uh, in the center of Anatolia. Um, it's often called the Battle of Angora or the Battle of Ankara, and it took place in 1402. In this case, uh, Bayezid I, who was the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, and we'll see much more about him in two weeks, actually three weeks, we'll see much more about him in three weeks. Um, and he at that time was launching a siege of Constantinople, right, which was still under the control of the Byzantine Empire. He rushed to meet Timur on the battlefield, which was a which was a bad mistake on his part because his troops arrived in a very hot July, and they were thirsty. What did Timur do? He diverted all the rivers, and used that to pick off uh, the Ottoman troops as they moved from place to place. 
the most difficult troops for Timur to actually defeat were actually those of one of Bayezid's vassals. Um, the Serbians, led by Stefan Lazarevich, um, brought uh, armored knights with him, as opposed to uh, Bayezid I, who brought with him uh, Turkish light cavalry. And these knights were the most effective forces against Timur. Still, though, Timur was an effective strategist and was able to remove the Serbians really from being an effective element in the equation. Um, and you can see on the right hand side, Bayez at the first surrendering to Timur um, and Timur ended up bringing him all the way to Samarkand where he languished in captivity. Bayez at the first died pretty soon after um, being taken into captivity. Um, he, he died even before uh, Timur himself would die uh, three years later. Uh, Richard, can I just add something? Uh... And, and I apologize if uh, you no, had some. No uh, so I know you're going to talk about Bayezid, but Bayezid was very accomplished um, commander. Uh, they already had defeated uh, and took a lot of the uh, lands from Serbia, Great Serbia, and they defeated Hungarians. He was very accomplished, and therefore he really didn't want to offend Timur. But they got into a scuffle of sending each other letters. <laughs> And one letter by as it writes to Timur that your wives, uh, how many you have, are actually going to be sleeping with other men <laughs> before they sleep with you. And Timur had lost his mind. It's like, this guy is crazy. I'm going to strangle him. It's completely not acceptable what he writes to me. He's completely, had, you know, there is no etiquette in him, you know, talking to me like that. And uh, so therefore, and at the end, when Timur conquers him, he puts him in a cage and he travels him throughout the country. There, Bayezid is like, a, is like an animal in a cage, is being traveled and shown to everybody. And therefore, he basically dies of shame more than anything. Uh, and that, that's very, uh, I think, Rich, I think you are uh, muted. Sorry, just wanted to add that. No, that that's, that's absolutely right. Um, so, yeah, um, obviously, as I said, in, in three weeks, we're gonna definitely talk about Sultan Bayezid uh, in the context of the Ottoman Empire. And so we'll see, uh, he was, as Zach pointed out, he was a very gifted commander. Uh, it just happened that Timur was more gifted. Now, it wasn't just that Timur stopped at the Battle of Ankara, he went all the way uh, to the water, right? And the city of Smyrna, um, which is today's modern Izmir, was a port on the Aegean Sea. And it wasn't held by the Turks at that point. It was held by the Knights Hospitaller. Uh, Timur besieged the city in 1402 um, and the castle uh, fell. Now, this led to the Knights Hospitaller retreating um, to, to Bodrum, which you can see on the lower right-hand side. Um, that would be a, that's a castle that was built um, in the subsequent uh, decades, but the Knights Hospitaller lost Smyrna and ironically, um, two islands uh, in, the, uh, in the Aegean Sea were vassals to the Hospitaliers at Smyrna, which meant that Timur acquired two islands uh, without having to set foot on them, which he probably wouldn't have since Timur had no navy to speak of and almost no uh, military expertise on the water. But it's sort of an irony of history that because of his siege at Smyrna and his success in taking that city, that he acquired those two areas. Now, after his siege here, he went back to Samarkand. He spent a year and change there before in 1404, preparing to invade China. But on his way to China, he died. And because of that, his army dispersed and went back to uh, his empire. So by the time he died in 1405, which was the maximal extent of the Timurid uh, Khanate, you can see how many territories it controlled. Those in the dark green are areas that were directly loyal to him. Those in other uh, types of green were his vassal states. And those in the shaded area in Anatolia, those are the areas where he had uh, devastated the local region, um, at, but he did not incorporate them into his empire. Um, as you can see, his territory matches more or less um, the territory of the Ilkhanat, right? The, and uh, although it does include a number of areas um, that previously had belonged to the Chagatayids, like Transoxiana. You can also see that um, he's surrounded by a number of historic enemies, right? The Mamluks, 
in the south, um, the Golden Horde to the north, and uh, Georgia, as I said, still remains there um, post uh, Timur's death. So as we move into that period after Timur, um, most of his empire is inherited by Shadol, but he only acquires it in 1409 because there's a massive civil war between Timur's successors. And Shadol controls most of the areas of central Iran um, and uh, central Asia, but as you can see, the areas of Western Iran fell under the control of the Karakoyunlu or the Black Sheep Turks. Uh, they were able in 1410 to defeat uh, the Jalayirids and take their control of the region. Now, Sharoch um, was able to uh, stand, uh, create a stable border, more or less, with, uh, with the Black Sheep Turks. There were three successive invasions that he led into their territory. Uh, in one of the in the final one, he appointed uh, the new leader uh, um, of the Black Sheep Turks, who was Shah Jahan. We'll talk about him in a second. But um, once Shah Jahan had been appointed, uh, relations between the Ilk uh, the Timurid Empire and the Black Sheep Turks uh, became a lot more peaceful, as at least as long as Sharoh was alive. Now Sharoh. Um, was responsible for a number of building and cultural projects throughout the empire. Uh, probably the most famous one is what you can see below. Uh, Gauhar Shad was his, uh, was his wife, one of his, uh, his prized wife. And he moved, uh, when he moved his court to Herat, uh, he built a mosque in her honor uh, in the city. So you can see uh, a picture of the mosque there. It's an older picture. Um, which is why the color is a little bit off, but it shows the mosque in all of its glory uh, with the beautiful green dome. He was also responsible for commissioning a number of uh, books and miniatures. And one of them uh, was a number of Persian mythological stories, um, including the story of Hoshang, which is a, a mythical Persian king. And you can see that um, this commission, Majma at Tawarikh, um, from Sharoch um, shows the artistry of the Persians at that time. Uh, I actually don't know uh, if, uh, I have a question if the Gauhar Shad Mosque uh, still exists. I believe it does, but I don't know for sure. Um, I don't think it's the kind of thing that the Taliban would have destroyed, but uh, I just, I don't know if it's still there. So, during the reign of Sharoch and uh, his successors, you have what's called the Timurid Renaissance, when you have this massive explosion of science, especially, but also art and architecture developing in Central Asia, especially around the area of Samarkand. And so you have Urugbeg, who is the son of Sharoch, um, and he builds an observatory in Samarkand. Uh, you can see the building in the left-hand side. Um, it sort of exists as a pendulum underground, um, and that's how you can observe the stars in their different positions. You have on the upper right-hand side, the Aksaray Palace, uh, and the Aksaray Palace was built in Shahri Sabz, which as uh, Zach noted, was the uh, birthplace of Timur, and this was his palace. You can see, if you look very closely at the size of the people, uh, just how tall and how vast uh, this palace was when it was in its full and completed form. You also had the development of a lot of poetry and miniatures, as you can see from the picture on the lower left-hand side, um, which is from Rose Garden of the Pious, which is um, a poet, uh, a, a long poem um, concerning uh, generally the, the idea of paradise after death. And finally, you have large mosque complexes that are built uh, in summer, uh, in Shahr Sabz and in areas around Samarkand, like the Kokumbaz. Um, this, was a, this was a moment of incredible uh, knowledge growth in chemistry. Uh, Al-Kashi and Al-Kushji uh, both worked in advanced uh, astronomical and chemical studies, and they were responsible for um, the the modern the mo much of modern astronomical calculations until the point of Tycho Brahe and Kepler, and of course, no discussion of the Timurid Renaissance would be complete without Registan, which is in the center area of Samarkand. 
Uh, the only part that was built during the uh, during the Timurid Renaissance, ironically, is the Ulugh Beg Madrasa, which is on the left-hand side, and you can see the interior courtyard in that center area. But the other two uh, mosques, uh, Tiliakori Madrasa and Shardur Madrasa, um, have become part and parcel of the Registan and for and and surrounding the plaza, creating that very unique feel. Uh, um, yeah, Zach, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to say that on a you know all the way in the back, you uh, you have I don't know if that's that's the uh, part, but you have lions on top, and uh, as you know, for Muslim religion. You're not supposed to depict any humans or animals, but uh, because uh, Amir Timur was Amir, and therefore uh, he was allowed to, through some kind of uh, exception, to depict two lions on top of the, uh, and his Timurids were able to depict the lions on top of the uh, minarets or close to the buildings uh, that adjacent to minarets. It was an interesting fact that I just want, you know, when I was in summer camp, pointed out. No, that's 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 absolutely correct. Um, one of the one of the interesting things, and of course, these are madrasas, right? These are schools of Islamic learning. Um, but oftentimes, you'll have these sort of negotiations between uh, religious leaders and uh, the wider population. So, I wanted to get into two aspects of Islamic thought that are important for sort of understanding where the where a lot of the religious thought is going to be shifting in this time period. So one of the things that we talked about is this idea of batinia, of the innerness, right? A lot of Islamic doctrine, especially if we look at mainstream Sunni thought, is based on what is called vahiriya, or apparentialism. Uh, that things are what they appear to be, that words mean what they say. Uh, batinia is not that. Uh, and Batinia is the idea that within all of these words and ideas are secret meanings that uh, that we need to uncover and truly understand. And the best explanation that I can sort of give for this sort of mentality is uh, from the Matrix movie, which is why I have that picture there. It, when Neo looks at the Matrix and he's able to see all of this code, he's seeing what's underneath uh, the appearance. He's seeing the true nature of what's flowing through the Matrix. And a person who is in this botan uh, mental state is seeing reality uncovered from the appearances that most people believe exist, right? And a lot of Sufi doctrines, especially, um, and post-Islamic religions rely heavily on botania, right? That, that the meaning of the Quran, of the Sunnah, of the Sira, of whatever set of Islamic doctrines exist is much deeper than the words themselves. And you need to know the true uh, meaning in order to understand this. The second one is the concept of Tawheed. And Tawheed is this idea of unity, that there's only one God, right? This idea of la ilaha illallah. There's no God but God, right? And a lot of cases, you, what you'll begin to have is the deification or quasi-deification of one of the leaders of, an, of the Islamic community. And because of that, you start shifting away from what is traditional Islam. And so um, at this time, especially in uh, Eastern Anatolia and the Southern Caucasus, you develop these Shiite heterodoxies, which are views where, um, uh, these are views where um, the botan of the Islamic experience, this inner nature of the Islamic experience is something different than uh, what, Muslims believe at an apparential level. One of the most important of these heterodoxies is what's called hurufism or letterism. And hurufism really started because if you look at a number of the surahs of the Quran, um, you'll notice very quickly you'll notice very quickly that um, they start with these random letters, right? Um, the alif lam ra that starts this verse has no actual meaning. Um, and most uh, scholars today in Islam um, who are in the more orthodox uh, ver versions of it will ascribe to it some supernatural or spiritual meaning. But at the end of the day, um, they're not interested in uh, pursuing some sort of super textural meaning, they sort of leave it alone. But the Horufis believed these letters represented 
a natural form of the body and that they're that they were connected to the metaphysical nature of men you can sort of see that picture in the upper left hand side where his eyes and his lips and his and his and his mustache are all made by arabic letters uh working in conjunction with his body that is sort of the idea of harufism that within these letters are secret meanings and harufism um came under fire in later Timurid periods because one of the Timurid uh, leaders was assassinated by somebody who was believed to be Harufi. At the same time, uh, in Ardabil, which is in northwestern Iran, you had Sheikh Safi ad-Din, and Sheikh Safi ad-Din was looking at poetry and was revealing the Batin within these poems, um, and he developed a very strong group of Sufi acolytes uh, who followed him uh, in, his, in his doctrine. His shrine, um, would eventually lead to, and uh, his shrine in Ardabil would eventually lead to who were called the Safaviyya. Um, these were monks who followed the teachings of Safi ad din right? That's why they're named Safaviyya. They're, they follow Safi's teachings. And in so doing, um, they began to become increasingly militarized and organized such that by the time of Sheikh Junaid and Sheikh Haidar, um, who come later in their history, um, they begin to be a militant threat uh, to the other regimes in the Caucasus region. So if we go back a little bit, we remember that Sharokh appointed Sheikh Jahan Shah as the leader of the Black Sheep Turks um, and in 1438. And for as long as Sharokh was alive, which was until 1447, uh, Jahan Shah was a strong ally of uh, Sharokh and the Timur Empire, and they were generally at peace with each other. Um, in order to put him on the throne, Kara Iskander uh, was overthrown. You can see his coin in the upper left-hand side. We have very little left from uh, Jahan Shah in terms of buildings or construction, but we do know that he built the Blue Mosque of Tabriz. You can see the inside of the Blue Mosque in the upper right-hand side. At this time, there began to become increased quarrels between the um, Black Sheep Turks, who are represented by that uh, Tamga that looks like a pretzel, and the White Sheep Turks, which are represented by the Tamga that looks like a number nine rotated 90 degrees. Um, the Black Sheep Turks and White Sheep Turks, we don't know how they got these names, but they became intense rivals uh, trying to fight over control of uh, what's now Western Iran and Eastern Anatolia. Uh, the Black Sheep Turks extended to their largest in 1458 and maintained that uh, for about a decade. At that time, the White Sheep Turks fought them, and it was in 1467 at the Battle of Chapakchur. Um, and after winning the Battle of Chapakchur, um, Uzun Hasan of the White Sheep Turks was able to conquer the entire uh, Black Sheep Turkish Empire. Uh, the only resistance was from Timurids, uh, led by Abu Said Mirza but they were defeated at the Battle of Karabakh, which was of course fought in the Karabakh region of modern Azerbaijan. Chabakchur was fought in Eastern Anatolia. Now the White Sheep Turks um, reunified most of Persia under their rule, under the rule of Uzun Hasan or uh, Tal Hasan. We have a very limited understanding of what happened during his reign. We know that he instituted a number of law codes which survived in, uh, in Mesopotamia and in Persia um, for another few decades when they would eventually be replaced by Ottoman law codes in Mesopotamia and Safavid law codes in greater Persia. We also know that Uzun Hasan was a deep enemy of the Ottomans and he fought with them on several occasions. We're gonna talk about that more when we talk about Ottoman expansion towards the East. But Uzun Hasan also had diplomatic relations with Europe. The Venetians saw themselves as the enemies of uh, uh, the enemies of the Ottomans, and so they reached out to the Akhoyun Lular, the White Sheep Turks, um, and they sent a number of ambassadors. Probably the most famous is Joseph at Barbaro. You can see him uh, in the center, and uh, just uh, we still have the writings of Joseph at Barbaro about uh, his discovery of Uzun Hasan's effectively Persian empire, right? He visits this, he's one of the first Europeans to visit the city of Pasargade, which is uh, the ancient uh, capital of, of Persia. And he is also responsible for trying to agitate Uzun Hasan to launch further wars against the Ottomans, um, which he did not end up doing. Um, 
Joseph Al-Barbaro ended up having to escape after Uzun Hasan died, and he did not want to stay in the court of Uzun Hasan's successor. At the same time, we have the growth of the Ismailis, uh, sorry, that we have the growth of the, of the Safavia, um, and they come by 1500 to control the area in green. Um, that is after uh, numerous militant campaigns by Sheikh Haidar, whose tomb you can see in the upper right-hand side. He launched several jihads against the Georgians and managed to bring a lot of the Turks in the Caucasus region under his banner through uh, a number of quasi, uh, de uh, yeah, he, he quasi deified himself and he quasi deified his, uh, uh, his antecedent, uh, Sheikh Junaid, and um, pulling on this idea of veneration for Ali that was present in a number of uh, even Sufi Turks in the region, he was able to sort of split the idea of Tawhid and create himself sort of as a god king on earth. So one of the thing, so that sort of covers what we're going to talk about with Timur. And this is sort of a map of where we're going to go, right? We've talked a lot about Persia. We've talked about Persia uh, for the uh, three last lectures, right? We talked about it there's actually four. We talked about it with the Great Sajjuk Empire. We talked about it with the Mongols. We talked about it with uh, the Ilkhanate. And now we talked about it with Timur. But after Timur and, uh, the, and the Timurid Empire sort of receding from, uh, from view, Persia becomes a much weaker state in comparison to the states emanating out of Anatolia. So we're going to see a movement of regional power away from Persia and towards Anatolia um, as we follow Anatolian history for a significantly longer period of time. Any questions on Timur, the Timurids, before we, before we sort of move on? You want to, want to uh, ask a question? Uh, well, I, I, have a quite, I have a question for you. Um, so when Timur fought Bayezid, I know that Bayezid was trying to find the allies to fight Timur. How come nobody came forward? Um, the, I mean, the thing is that who would, who would Bayezid have allied with, right? The Georgians, Mam Mamluks, vassals. Mamluks, no? Uh, the, 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 yeah, um, Bayezid was looking to the Mamluks, but uh, the Mamluks had also had better relations with uh, the Ottomans. Um, the two of them were not good allies. So that, that's why the Mamluks didn't interfere. I see. Um, so, uh, you, have to, you, you, you have to remember the Mamluks were also quite afraid of um, any interactions uh, with, uh, with Timur, which is why they jailed both uh, um, Kara Yusuf of the Black Sheep Turks and um, Ahmed Jalair of the Jalayirids when they came seeking asylum in the Mamluk states. They, they did not want to antagonize Timur. I see. There's an interesting fact, as, as you have mentioned, Timur quite extensively had employed rape. They said when they entered Georgia, and the reason Stalin it's you know have <laughs> the same pedigree as Timur Timur Lame is because there might have been some Timur blood when they entered Georgia. They there might be a mix <laughs> going on. Yeah, no, it's 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 very possible, and <laughs> yeah, it's it's you know it's a sad it's a sad part of you know, and, and they both both had problems with their hands where Stalin's hand was an operational. So as when they found the corpse of Timur, the same thing was, it, it was basically his, his hand was going out as well. So yeah, he, I mean, the, the reason yeah. he got that name, Tamerlane, was right because an arrow had been shot through his hand and his leg, um, right. rendering him lame. And he, and he walked with a, um, you know, a pronounced limp through all of his life. Um, he was able to ride horses, which is what really helped him get around. But um, for example, when he crossed the Hindu Kush to come into India, um, he had to be tobogganed and rowed and lowered ropes. There, there was a lot of difficulty in, in getting him around because he couldn't walk that easily. Wow. Um, now, I had asked Zach um, there um, because we had that Islamic uh, lecture um, from Sheikh uh, Sheikh Nabil. Um, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, 
Yeah, Abdil, Abdil, right, correct. Yeah, well, uh, Marun and Abdil, right, exactly. Uh, yeah, Sabil Ahmad. Uh, we had that lecture from Sabil Ahmad, and there were a few comments that I wanted to make about his presentation. Um, the first, I, I always want to start with the positive when critiquing somebody, right? Um, I think he really, uh, and so I thank Zach also for giving me the opportunity to say this. Um, so I think he did a really good job in painting um, what most Muslims really want, which is sort of an alliance of good people to stand against racism and bigotry, that Islam, generally speaking, in terms of its practitioners, is generally peaceful. Um, and of course, there are violent individuals, but like any other community, that they're a minority. Uh, I think he really answered the question concerning who will get into paradise, who won't, uh, quite well. Um, and uh, basically, I think that at the end of the day, um, his description of paradise and what it would look like really uh, matched the Islamic sources. And I think he did a really great job of putting that forward. I think he also really explained why Muslims consider all the prior prophets to be Muslims and sort of expanding the Islamic history back to the pre-Muhammad period. I think, I think he really na nailed that piece of theology and sort of explaining it to uh, Westerners. And I also think he really clarified the concept of Tawheed, this oneness of God and the way that Muslims understand that oneness. That I've said that, there were a couple of things that he mentioned that are either historically inaccurate or um, might be accurate from a religious perspective, but not accurate from a historical perspective. And so the first one that I wanted to point out, um, he mentioned, somebody asked him about slavery and he talked about how the Islamic world worked to manumit slaves and that Islam as a belief uh, is about that. Um, I won't challenge the question of belief, but I will challenge the question of historicity. As we know, because we've talked about the Sakaliba and the Zanj and the and the Mamluks and the Ghilman and all of these other kinds of slaves that have been imported to the Islamic world, that Islam uh, Islamic empires did not preside over a large uh, diminution in slavery. In fact, they increased the slave trade to massive proportions. They invented new and modernized ways of trading slaves, of moving slaves, of, of, of buying slaves. They, they created different functions for slaves all the way uh, from plantation workers at the very bottom to administrative functionaries at the very top. I mean, as we talk about the Mamluk Sultanates, those are cases of slaves uh, who literally uh, took over their own country. And of course, um, there's the, argument that Muslims never had uh, chattel slavery, anything like the US South, which is false. Uh, we talked about the Zand revolts um, that took place in the late 800s. Um, and those were revolts of black slaves who were on plantations in, uh, growing cotton. Uh, there were other causes of that revolt um, that were not related to slavery, but the slaves did revolt against their masters uh, in that case. Howard, did you want to add something? Now, th these are two versions of the same passage, I take it? Yeah, that was the next thing yeah. I was going to talk about. Okay. Um, because he uh, he mentioned the oft-repeated uh, line from, uh, from most Muslims, which is that the Quran has not been altered in any way over the last 1400 years. Um, and that is proof of God's uh, beneficence. Mm -hmm. um, in Arabic, they say, not a jot or tittle has been changed, if I can use the idiomatic translation. But um, we know from the early hadiths that there were seven kira'at or readings of the Quran. And this is especially problematic because in Arabic, as you can see, um, a lot of words are defined by how many dots they have and the diacritical marks above them. Early Qurans did not have these. So different people would read the same word as two different words. And of these seven kira'at, we don't know how many of those survive. We have two kira'at that have survived to the present day. The first one is the Hafs Kira'at, uh, which is used by the Kira'a, which is used by the majority of Muslims, overwhelming majority. Um, both Sunni and Shia will use Hafs. Warsh is used exclusively in North Africa by Moroccans, Algerians, and Tunisians. Um, but the fact that we have these two Kira'at mean that, of course, something has changed. Now, I show now of the verses that are different, different between the Hafs version and the Warsh version, there are about 51 to 57 verses that are different out of a total of 6,200 verses in the Quran. So we're talking about a 1% uh, difference. 
but it belies the claim that there's no difference and that the Quran has been perfectly preserved because of course, which Quran has been preserved? Is it Hafs or Warsh, if either of them? Now this particular verse, Quran 757, there's one word that in Hafs is rendered as Bushran, meaning good tidings, and in uh, Warsh is rendered as Nushran, meaning, um, meaning uh, to disperse or dispersing. So you can see that the English verse uh, changes a little bit in terms of its meaning when you translate those words differently. The majority of other cases of differences between Hafs and Warsh are usually differences in who the verb is conjugated for or whether it's a passive or active verb, things like that. Another thing that he mentioned was uh, Islamic social justice and Islamic equality for all religions. Of course, we've seen throughout history that that's not accurate that there are different legal statuses for different religious faiths within Islamic empires. It was certainly better than competing systems, especially under Christendom, but to say that it was anything like modern social justice um, is, is incorrect from a historical perspective. Um, another thing that was sort of uh, blithed over was the difference um, between mysticism um, and how it applies to different sects and what the differences are between Sunnis and Shiites. Um, as we've gone over in, in this series, there's actually a huge number of differences between Sunnis and Shiites. Uh, they originally start from those political differences, but then expand to the questions of imamate and the veneration of Ali and um, other theological issues. Of course, the fundamental issues between the sects in terms of their, in terms of warfare, usually come from political issues like political repression or uh, exile from the uh, exile from the empires, and uh, finally, um, uh, Sabil Ahmad mentioned uh, a number of cases of the lesser jihad, or be the lesser jihad being um, when Muslims resort to political action in order to defend the Islamic community, be that political action on the tamer side, such as uh, protests, or on the more violent side, such as military conquest, and he. Uh, put that under the label of a reaction to Western colonialism. And while that's certainly true, there is a reaction to Western colonialism that manifests in lesser jihad. Um, we have numerous instances of lesser jihad existing throughout history where no Western colonialists or imperialists are involved because of its connection to uh, Islamic law and doctrine um, throughout the ages. We've seen a number of cases of jihad already in this series, but one that we haven't seen um, for example, is the war that Sa the Sa'adians fought against the Songhai. It was actually a Muslim on Muslim jihad, um, but uh, it was very clearly declared by the Sa'adians that the Songhai were, uh, were takfiri or, non or, dis or uh, blasphemers. And as takfiri, um, they were subject to violence in a jihad. So I just wanted to make those quick points. Obviously, uh, his lecture was very nice and uh, established sort of a 101 base for a lot of people who are less familiar with Islam, but as we've seen, uh, but when we come to these historical questions, uh, a more nuanced approach is generally necessary. Excellent, Rich. Thank you so much. And of course, tomorrow we'll continue, uh, and then you know, obviously, we can do this uh, um, also his historicity of it um, on our next lecture. So we're going to talk about the Sharia law. There's going to be probably a lot of parallels to the history that then you can draw, Rich, and then we can answer. Absolutely. Sharia is a historical process, just like any right. other uh, any other law-creating process. Uh, could I, uh, could I make a qu ask a question uh, by way of an observation? Sure. Or maybe it's more of an observation than a question, but um, it, it, it seems to me that uh, from this... Uh, from your lecture and from other, uh, you know, uh, readings of the history, um, that uh, the Muslim world is not uh, was not more peaceful than the Christian world. It it does seem that uh, you know all three of the major of the Western monotheistic faiths. Uh, did value peace in principle, but uh, in practice, maybe not so much. Um, I, I'm not sure if it's an Abrahamic religions thing. Um, I see it as much in the East. If you look at, for example, Southeast Asia, um, 
uh, and I would advise reading, for example, about the mandala systems here, because that's really what's relevant. Um, when the mandalas would overlap, you had numerous wars between Buddhist aligned groups. You had mm -hmm. wars between Hindu aligned groups before the Buddhism converted most of these Hindus to Buddhist, uh, to Buddhism. Um, and it's just the nature of politics that groups will come and fight each other. And oftentimes you need some kind of religious legitimacy or theological legitimacy in order to justify why uh, one group should be able to prevail over a certain piece of land, right? So, yes, yes, yeah. I, I think you're making my point <laughs> right. that in that in practice, um, uh, you know, rulers do what rulers do. Um, you know, when I when I read from uh, the Tanakh, the um, uh, the books of Kings, from you know the Haftorah readings from on on Saturdays, um, mm -hmm. the 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 part of the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, that's not not Torah, but the, but the other writings, which are either prophetic or, or of, of, of King's literature, which is of the royal courts. They're, they're a lot like medieval courts, you know, in the, yeah. in the rivalries for the throne and, you know, brother against brother and, um, you know, son against father and vice versa. I mean, it's really, <laughs> it's disheartening. <laughs> no, no, it's, 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 it's absolutely the case is that, um, these uh, these are political entities, and the, as a result, you're going to see that kind of internecine strife, and it's and it's unfortunate because a lot of people will vest their religious sense of purity and what they want the religion to be, and may and the religion may well be that, right? It may be in a political entity, um, but you can't then graft that onto the historical experience of these various empires because that's just not the case, right? Um, so you, so I think there needs to be a sort of reticence about what these empires were doing and and what that means. And it, and it's of course it's a conflict between the ideal and the real. Right. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. And 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 I think we also have to recognize that whatever the standard of the day is, uh, three hundred years later, uh, looks monstrous. So we're here on Zoom. We think we're all smart. We're nice, all this stuff, you know, our great, 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 great grandkids will think we're monsters in 300 years. So, I mean, I think there is a relativism that we can't forget. So, yeah. Now, on the other hand, you're dealing, you're dealing with warrior cultures and, and the religion, the religion may matter to them, but it's not as important as killing enemies. In, in a sense, if you have a long, complicated religious work, you can usually find the quotes you need to justify what you're gonna do. Right. No, I mean, the thing is, is that, um, and this is sort of why I always find it hilarious when people talk about Sufis um, and they don't know the historical context. Sufis marched at the head of armies. Uh, sultans would routinely use them uh, because the high nobles, aristocracy, and legal jurists, right, the Islamic legal jurists, the, uh, the fuqaha, um, they didn't have, right, because they came from a very different class. The Sufis were poor, and so their religious fervor was seen as genuine by people. Um, so it's, yeah. It's interesting. Uh, it's it, to draw, yeah. first of all, incredible presentation. I, I've, you know, say, thank you so much, and uh, Howard. Cute, cute cat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> exactly. Just wanted, just wanted to uh, say, if you put in a context of percentage killing, does Timur Lame would take the helm, or how would that, or Mao? Yeah, no, oh, that, that's exactly right. No, uh, Timur killed 17 million people. If you remember from my Mongol presentation, I had those five uh, mass murders of history. Um, that puts him in fourth place um, in front of Hitler. Uh, but below Stalin. But the thing is that the world population was significantly smaller at that time. So um, we know that Timur was responsible for killing 5% of the world, um, which is higher than anybody else. And his world was much smaller uh, mm -hmm. than the world of Shingis Khan. So even though Shingis Khan killed more people, he killed about 40 million people. Um, his world was much bigger because the Black Death had not ravaged it. Um, and the Mongols had not yet ravaged it, right? The, Timur was coming after these massive population decreases. So 
Timur's Timur's killing was the worst of any single conqueror in history. Yeah, and the thing we have to view is that is that continuum over those, you know, basically less than two hundred years uh, was astronomical, right? I mean, you know, you're looking at several hundred million people dying across either disease, war, uh, butchery, whatever, um, against the the population of that era. I mean, um, outside clearly events in history that we don't have documented, you know, tens, thousands of years ago occurred uh, that were probably just as, as devastating, but, right. but nothing on that scale in the, you know, modern documented world in the last 3000 years, uh, you know, except maybe the collective destruction of the last 200 years, but that's so sort of scattershot um, right. No, and I, and I would say the destruction of the last 200 years, as many bodies have fallen in that, and I don't want to disrespect them, those were bo- like the percentage of people who were alive that ended up dying as a result of those wars is much smaller. And so you have right. a much and, and so you're much more able to rebuild. I mean, we have we have cities like, for example, I showed Merv. Merv never recovered from from the assaults of, of Shingis Khan. Well, it was actually Tolui, but uh, of Tolui Khan. Um, and you have a number of these cities in Persia that just stopped existing. Like there, there, there just weren't there just wasn't the population to rebuild them. Um, you had a massive problem when Hulegu Khan was uh, consolidating Persia, um, and especially in Mesopotamia because farmers had just left. Like those the the Khanat had dried up, the water channels had dried up. Uh, from the irrigation networks and they were just the, the land wasn't viable and so the peasants just left um and so you had these massive depopulation issues that um really were not were not fixed in any way and it wasn't until the modern period that the population even recovered let alone the massive amounts of infrastructure uh that needed to be rebuilt yeah so i mean i think the closest thing. i think the closest um example of that is you know in the first half of the century of the 20th century what basically ukraine and poland went through i mean that's probably and that was so unique i mean basically ukraine and poland um you know let's say central china during uh 50 you know 8 to 62 i mean there's like a couple of these crazy kind of hot spots in the last few hundred years the difference is this was like there was like 50 of these hot spots during you know Tamerlan, right, uh, or, or 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 Chinggis, yeah. right? It's or, or or the Black Death. I mean, I think that's I think that's really the difference is that these yeah, absolutely. There's know. another thing there though. I, I think in the ancient engineers, I was reading that that Tamerlan got basically that whole area out there is it, it uh, is irrigated. There's extensive irrigation work to support the agriculture. If somebody goes up and slaughters peasants and kills in the canals. That's it. There's no economy left. Yeah, no, that, that's that's definitely a part of it. But the thing is that Shingis Khan um, intentionally destroyed the Khanat, intentionally destroyed these irrigation channels. So they they not only were the peasants killed, but the actual land was no longer viable because it became dust. Yeah. Oh, my God. So I just wanted to, uh, again, thank you, Richard. I just wanted to uh, walk us through a little bit of upcoming things. Tomorrow we're doing Sharia mm-hmm. law, which is part of Islam 101. Uh, would be Dr. Sabil and uh, Naru presenting. So uh, do join us. We're going to have over, you know, between Facebook streaming and uh, Zoom over 300 people. So then um, on, and then next Tuesday, we don't have any more presentation this week, except next Tuesday, Richard is going to talk about the uh, Islamization of Turkey and early Ottoman, which we touched on a little bit today, but um and then it will be followed by women in Islam. So with everything that's going on right now with uh, Taliban, um, and then we want to really find out what you know what really um, women's place in in the religion. I'm I'm going to take the bold step of saying that I am against throwing acid in women's faces. <laughs> I, I I know that it's a controversial topic. <laughs> but uh, you know, I'll, I'm just going to put my views on the life on the line here. Well, we are we all in agreement that that's <laughs> not, that's not well, what you know, is that an Islamic tradition or is that no. just a tradition? I thought that was something that happens in India a lot. I, I don't know if it happens in India. I know that it that in Afghanistan it was a pre-Islamic tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, no, there 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 are a lot of 
very strange traditions that exist in Afghanistan that are that you know whatever whatever you think of the Taliban, um, these aren't Islamic. Um, for example, Bachi Bazi is not Islamic, and the Taliban actually did a lot of work to stop that, um, which is the rape of young boys, um, because it's because it's not an Islamic practice; it's a pre-Islamic practice. I, I mean, I, I think we have to recognize that there are all over the world, you know, still um, very ancient proto-tribal uh, behaviors that exist, and they graft themselves onto the modern world. So people might have cell phones and AK-47s and a really nice land cruiser. I wish I could have. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but then they still have traditions or components of traditions, I think is probably the right way to put it, you know, maybe cherry pick um, that, you know, uh, trace their way back for, for, for various reasons in, 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 in more ancient tribal history. And, and, and I, I think by once again, our standards, you know, everything is, is horrible, but, by the way they lived indigenously, that was, you know, a rubric, right? And you see that with Aztec or, you know, I think the Aztecs are probably the more, one of the more extreme, a large, especially large scale in, in, in Mesoamerica that had, you know, traditions that were not very standard, even by Mayan or Inca practices. Um, and so, you know, you have certain tribal, um, you know, acts and behaviors that, you know, are still around because of that, you know, for maybe a few more, maybe another 50 years or hundred years or whatever. What is Islamic dot? Okay. What type of Christianity is a lot of Christian holidays and a lot of Christian practices, even saints and stuff are actually adopted from earlier pagan figures. A lot, a lot of the worship of the Virgin Mary apparently is based on, on is based on pagan practices. And apparently the Catholic Church, the there's a version of Guadalupe or something like that. There's Absolutely. Not, they didn't actually appropriate Aztec practice, other than human sacrifice, adopt, adopted Aztec practices. Yeah. Is there anything well, that can be like that can be traced to Islam? You you mean like something that exists in a Christian society today because the Christians conquered Muslim territory, or are you saying no? It's more a question of is Islamics move in and take over people that are performing that are oh absolutely Um, actually actually this sort of digs a little deeper into what we were talking about today. Um, I mentioned when it came to the Safaviya, right, that they were creating these cults of personality around Sheikh Junaid, Sheikh Haidar. Um, and eventually Sheikh Haider's son, Shah Ismail I of the Safavid dynasty, right? Because he ends up conquering territory and creating a new Iranian empire. Um, but the reason he was able to galvanize so many soldiers to this sort of cult of personality is that there was a lot of veneration of Ali that existed among the Turkmen tribes that existed in the, um, the Southern Caucasus region and Eastern Anatolia. And the reason you had such strong Ali worship was that Ali in many ways uh, took on a lot of representations from Tengrism, um, that a lot of the values of Tengrism were expressed through Ali. Um, and so they could preserve being Tengrist, but Ali had these kinds of qualities. And so Ali, the veneration of Ali became in a certain way a representation of Tengrism. And so you have this weird situation where you have Sunni, ostensibly, ostensibly Sunni, um, Turkmen taking on something that looks more like a Shiite belief, right? Because the veneration of Ali is generally a Shiite belief. And eventually, when they get co-opted by the Safaviyya and become what are called the Kizilbash, the redheads, um, they are operating in a Shiite worldview because of the pre-existing uh, religious matrix. Um, we see a lot more Islamic syncretism outside of the Middle East um, than we do inside of the Middle East um, because of the pressures from the caliphate being in the Middle East. But um, a perfect example, you see a lot of this stuff in Indonesia. There's a lot of stuff from uh, the Hindu tradition, the Buddhist tradition, and the pre um, the, uh, the previous shamanistic traditions of Indonesia that have become holidays within Indonesian Islam. Um, unfortunately, first, I don't know much about the specifics on that topic. And secondly, a lot of them are being overwritten as Saudi Arabia is having increased religious influence over Indonesia. Thank you, Richard. Let me just continue on the schedule and then we can have a a little bit of discussion. But I also don't want to keep Richard because tomorrow is a working day 
I apologize. Okay. So uh, I just want to go through a schedule and maybe we'll add there and there. And we have tomorrow, by the way, tomorrow you guys can get in a little bit earlier because my Zoom taps out at 100 people. And so if you get in earlier tomorrow, 15 minutes before seven o'clock, then I will be able to let you in. If not, then I'll have to wait, get rid of some people to let you in. And it would be not be very nice. So <laughs> because Zoom is quite expensive for over 300 and 500 people. So. Uh, if you can tomorrow, like I said, if you can get in by the six forty-five, there'll be plenty of time. So I, I just want to mention. Yeah. I just want to mention with regards to my series. We're going to meet next week, but the week after that, the week of Thanksgiving, that Tuesday, we will not meet, and we will meet the following Tuesday. That's the thirtieth of November, right? So um, we're we're going to miss that week, um, so that way everybody can prepare their turkeys. Um, and uh, then we'll then we'll resume normalcy on November thirtieth. All right. So, uh, having said that, um, so we have Roman expansion on the uh, November twentieth. Uh, Paul is going to present that. We're going to talk about Samnite's War. Um, then we have Alex C wants to do a Bronze Age in Asia. She's doing it the first time. She's done quite a research on that. So this should be an interesting one. Uh, what, what part of Asia is she focusing on? Uh, she said that anything outside of China. <laughs> okay. So that not China. So not, not China. China. Okay. But I, you know, but she hadn't really gave me, give me the, the, the itinerary. Then I'm, I'm trying to get somebody to help me with Marcos Aurelius stoicism on the 24th. Mm -hmm. Anybody is interested, you know, has some ideas. I want to talk about history of stoicism. I'm going to hit on Mark. Yeah, I actually, um, I have a friend of mine from another group. Uh, and I know uh, Richard, uh, I think you, yeah, you, you met Luke from, yep. from, from, from Ryan's group who yep. uh, knows a lot actually about stoicism and, you know, kind of went down the rabbit hole with that. So maybe we could, we could introduce you Zach uh, to him and then, uh, you know, you could bring him on and, and, you know, he could maybe, uh, you know, go into that. That would be awesome, man. And yeah. uh, I, I'd love, you know, you, you know, for you guys to be there because I, sure. and, you know, and if you could just add some stuff because I am, I mean, I, on a daily basis, I do read stoicism quotes, yeah. but it's not really, you know. Yeah. I mean, Luke is, is very real into this, like for the last, whatever, five, whatever, five plus years that it's been sort of repopularized um so I, I think it might be really good if uh do a, a kind of an intro with with you and him and uh and then you guys kind of take it from there and then richard anything else you want to add to that i think no i i think i think that's brilliant um this i like look I, i'm i know where my expertise ends and uh, uh roman history and stoicism are not my are not my strongest suits so uh, i'll have to leave that to those who are more capable and just uh, honorary mention, uh, Howard is doing a third Punic War and the third Macedonian War together. Um, and uh, that should be interesting, the uh, particular destruction of Carthage. And then we have an outing, right? We go out on the 28th to the Ukrainian Museum on the, uh, around the 20th Street um, and the uh, uh, Marivan uh, restaurant after that. So, uh, you know, the, fits, the, the, the seats are being filled, filled in soon. So, you know, go ahead and, you know, put your name so I can do a reservation and uh, we'll have a lot of fun, you know, doing that. And, uh, you know, and Richard comes back on the 30th and talks about the growing, growing pain of adamants. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So just so if, if you want to have a sense, uh, next week's presentation will cover the end of the Sajuk, uh, the Sajuk Sultanate of Rome. Uh, and all the way to the death of Murad I in the Battle of Kosovo. Um, then Ottoman Growing Pains, which is going to be on the 30th of November, that's going to cover Bayezid I um, until, um, uh, until the, the death of Murad II. And then um, on December 7th, there's, uh, we're going to do Mehmet, um, the Conqueror, um, who is so exciting. Uh, that I'm going to spend an hour just telling you all about what color hair he has. It's just, it's going to be fantastic. You know, maybe we should play a, a little clip from the uh, the recent series. It was really amazing series of, uh, 
the uh, you know team you know explaining who he was and that actor was really good um, in, in Constantinople uh, series. It's really interesting. I, I actually enjoyed it. Yeah, I mean he I mean he he won that battle in his I think he was 21 when when he when he conquered Constantinople uh, you know uh he he was an early starter. Yeah, I mean I especially like the piece where the slave woman that uh, escapes and tries to negotiate with him and then she he starts speaking Greek and yeah uh, and then you know and then she, she goes to her yes devil does speak Greek. <laughs> <laughs> That was that was awesome. It was like <laughs> no, uh, the Europeans loved him. We actually have a lot of European portraits of him. We know that he visited uh, Rome several times um, because he spoke all the European languages. He spoke Italian, I believe. I, I know for certain he spoke French. Um, he was he he was similar to Timur in the sense of being this sort of cultured polymath person as well as being a conqueror. But of right. course. When we say he's a conqueror, it's a lot different than Timor. He was not, he was not interested in large skull mounds. No, it was Timor. Really seemed to enjoy, <laughs> yeah, that that part. Uh, and again, you know, um, you know, who are we to judge at this point? But we can't pass a judgment because we've lived through, you know, I not lived, but we're, you know, our at least our grandparents witnessed two major killers: Stalin, and Hitler. And uh, you know, and Mao, and Mao, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you have a small, and Pol Pot. Pol Pot, they have a smaller version of that, correct? Um, yeah. Well, percentage-wise, he did better than everybody else. Yeah, that yeah. I mean, he basically destroyed a third of Cambodia. Right. Oh, actually, read up the guy you got to read up on there is Francisco Solano Lopez. Um, depending on which account you read. There were either 1.2 million Paraguayans or 500,000 Paraguayans yeah. at the start of the war. Yeah. And there were, I think, 20,000 men left alive at the end of it. Yep. You, get, you forget one. Well, wait, wait, are you talking about the Grand Chaco War? <laughs> are, you talking about Cam- are you talking about Cambodia or the Grand Chaco War? The Grand I'm, Chaco right, War. No, the Grand Chaco was, so this is the war, I, I think in Brazil, it's the War of the Triple Alliance. Yeah, okay. it's the War of the Triple Alliance. Yeah, that, that one was absolutely insane. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we, we got to go. I mean, I, I started with some of the, uh, you know, I did the, uh, I mean, we did. Hitler. Yeah, but do, do we really want to be like the death meetup? I mean, is that like really the. I'm moving away from that for the next few lessons. OK, so, <laughs> like... <laughs> Richard, Richard, thank you very much again. Yeah, it was incredible. Yeah. And thank you. I want to wish everybody a nice evening. And I'll yep. see you guys uh, tomorrow. If you can log in a little earlier tomorrow, I appreciate it. Because- and, and, and I do have one recommendation for everyone. If you like spy um, uh, type uh, ser- series, there's, a, there's one called, uh, uh, called The Bureau. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's on Prime. It's very good. It's five seasons. It's French. Uh, it's the French uh, intelligence services and all the other um kind of services in the world it's really it's very well written it's very kind of jean leclerc old style 1970s 80s so if any of you like that all right thank you so much and have a nice evening everybody and uh richard amazing job and i'll see you guys yeah. soon. great job richard. thank you richard yes thank you everybody for participating great, great job richard bye-bye all right bye